Jeff very much and uh, it's great and also a great honor to be here so thank you for all the organizers. So as uh, Jeff uh, said the origin of this uh, talk and uh, paper at some point I hope was in a, in a seminar we taught in the spring of 2021 and we were reading on freedom by Du Châtelet in English translation by Julia Jorati and then of course we've already discussed uh, Locke uh, uh, Leib and Leibniz in the course before that but we also had a kind of background in in Bia Bale and Christian Wolf. So we came up with this idea that there might be something interesting if we kind of at least make a comparison between Du Châtelet and Wolf on, on freedom. And that's uh, what we are doing today. But we are also looking at the kind of historical question whether Du Châtelet was acquainted with Wolf on free will when she was writing the essay on, on freedom. But the main point is more like a comparison and, and we hope that that kind of comparison can shed light on both uh, philosophers uh, with respect uh, to freedom. And this is still quite much uh, work in progress and uh, we are not, we are in a new territory here as we heard uh, from Jeff's introduction. So we are also very happy to learn from you about anything uh, in this topic. And we are going to limit our discussion to on freedom. So we are not going to discuss kind of later uh, passages in Du Châtelet's uh, letters, for example, which seems to be relevant and, uh, and interesting for her view on on freedom, but uh, because they are later than this essay, we think it's a bit problematic to use them uh, to read uh, this essay. Because clearly her uh, thinking was in such a movement around these times that, that uh, we should be careful uh, of not reading later stuff into this, uh, into this essay. Anyway, so in On Freedom, uh, we claim Du Châtelet's uh, conception of the will is actually quite close to Wolf's conception of the will. So both think that the understanding morally necessitates the will. So at least in the respect of the relation between uh, the understanding and the will, uh, they are both uh, uh, compatibilists and intellectualist compatibilist, to be more precise. But then there is a clear difference between their views uh, regarding the relation between willings and uh, physical action in particular. And basically, Wolf is very sympathetic to pre-established harmony here, whereas uh, Du Châtelet doesn't seem to be. So perhaps she is more into some kind of occasionalism here. But that's also a bit on, 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 on quite scarce uh, uh, textual uh, basis that we can say that. But anyway, there, there seems to be a, a clear difference between their views in, in that respect. And related to that, uh, Du Châtelet kind of locates freedom more in action than Wolf. So Wolf kind of uh, primarily thinks that freedom is in, the, in, in willings. Okay, so the talk has uh, five parts. So first uh, I'm going to talk uh, or give you a, in a kind of nutshell presentation of, of Wolf on, on free will. Then uh, uh, quite quickly I will make some remarks on this issue whether Du Châtelet was acquainted with Wolf on free will in 37. And then also kind of uh, interesting, also philosophically interesting 
issue in this topic is the pietist controversy that began in, in 1721 between Wolf and uh, especially Joachim Lange, his, uh, his uh, colleague at Halle at the moment. And one actually interesting question is how, how much Duchatelet du uh, knew about this controversy uh, in, in uh, around 37. Then uh, we are going to do the, perhaps the main uh, part of the talk, Du Chatelet on Freedom. And finally, uh, we will wrap things up. But let's go to Wolf on Free Will. By the way, I, I love this picture. <laughs> 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 perhaps next time I will dress like <laughs> Wolf. <laughs> uh, a real gentleman, <laughs> I guess. Anyway. As is well known, uh, uh, Wolf's view has background in theodicy by, by Leibniz, where Leibniz famously analyzes uh, uh, freedom into intelligence, uh, uh, contingency, intelligence, and spontaneity. But I'm not going to talk about that more, just remarking that clearly there is a background. But Wolf's view is not the same as Leibniz's view, whatever Leibniz's view is. I'm a Leibniz scholar. There are other people in the, in the room who can tell more about that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, most uh, Wolf scholars seem to think that uh, Wolf uh, emphasizes spontaneity uh, among these three components uh, more than Leibniz. And he also introduces a German term here in, in the German metaphysics, and that German term is Willkür. And uh, in a later work in, in, uh, in the Latin uh, version of uh, empirical psychology, uh, Wolf says that uh, uh, spontaneity or willkür is an intrinsic principle determining acting. But uh, we are going, next we are going only to discuss uh, actually quotes from, from the German metaphysics by, by Wolf. Uh, and because that's the work, it, it's likely that, that that's the work Du Châtelet was acquainted with around uh, 37. Anyway, so in the German metaphysics in chapter three, uh, discussing the empirical psychology and also freedom of the will, uh, uh, Wolf uh, defines freedom in the following way. Freedom Freiheit is nothing other than the power, Vermögen, of the soul through its own spontaneity for choosing that one among two equally possible things that pleases it most. End of quote. So, uh, according to this definition, freedom is the power of choosing, that is, bringing about the re resolution as a change if you couple this uh, definition with, uh, with the definition of power earlier in the work. So freedom is the power of choosing, uh, according to Wolf in the German metaphysics. So I might, for example, consider in the books of whether to buy the German metaphysics or the foundations of physics by Du Châtelet. And let's assume I represent, perhaps correctly, the foundations as good and better than the German metaphysics to myself by my understanding, uh, Verstand. So according to both this representation, Vorstellung is a motive, Bewegungsgrund, uh, and Crown slash reason, Grund, or Ratio, Ratio in Latin, necessitating the will to choose the foundations, and what it. And this necess necessitation here is uh, moral rather than absolute necessity or necessity in itself, unselbst, involves you. So it is still possible in itself or absolutely possible to choose the German metaphysics and to act accordingly, that is, to buy the German metaphysics rather than the foundations of physics. 
So this is absolutely possible, even in the case when the, when the will is morally necessi necessitated by the understanding uh, to want the foundations. So my willing doesn't restrict absolute possibilities or possibilities in itself in this case in Wolf's view. The will is uh, morally determined by the understanding. But uh, Wolf, uh, Wolf thinks that this is not a problem due to freedom because actually it is compatible with freedom, this, uh, this determination or necessitating. Uh, and actually he thinks that I am free when I'm determined by a rational representation, that is a rational crown or crowns. So then I'm not a slave of indistinct uh, sensual effects. So Wolf is not denying that these indistinct sensual effects are also motives and, and grounds for willing and, and acting, but at least some of them uh, do not uh, constitute rational grounds for willing or acting. And the ground of the freedom of the will and action is in the soul. So he says, for the representations that are needed for motives are in it and come from it, namely the soul, and it is inclined through its own power, craft, towards whatever pleases it, end of quote. So we can see that for Wolf, any willing is spontaneous, so it's self-determined, uh, determined by the understanding. And Wolf, quite clearly, we think, is an intellectual compatibilist, both regarding the relation between the understanding and the will, and, and, uh, and also regarding action. So he's not a, not a voluntarist or, or, or libertarian here. And he thinks that the soul is a simple thinking thing. So it is not a corporeal substance. The soul power of, uh, the, soul power of the soul is, to quote, a power representing the world according to the position of its body in the world. Therefore, uh, Wolf thinks that the understanding and will are not uh, numerically distinct powers or faculties of the soul. They are one and the same power. And this is actually quite an important point also uh, with regard to, to what uh, Du Châtelet says in, in On Freedom. But Wolf thinks that there are also simple substances that cannot think. So there are simple substances that can think and those that cannot think. And these simple substances that cannot think compose corpuscles or physical atoms and hence also compounds are, are, are composed in, uh, in, uh, according to Wolf. And he considers uh, uh, pre-established harmony between the, the simple substances that can think, namely the souls, and those that cannot think uh, as the kind of most probable hypothesis of the communication between these two kinds of uh, simple substances. But he's a little bit hesitant here. So he also only seems to think that this is the most probable hypothesis of the communication. Because the contenders uh, 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 are quite bad in Wolf's view, and the contenders here are, are the uh, physical influx and uh, Malebranchian occasionalism. And he rejects them for, for, for certain reasons. Okay, uh, section two, whether Du Châtelet was acquainted with Wolf with this stuff. Uh, around uh, 37 or not. Okay, uh, the first point is that we find it quite implausible th that uh, Voltaire didn't know about the controversy between Wolf and the Pietist that had already begun in, in 1721 at Hall, Halle, and actually was reignited in, in 35 again. And there were hundreds and hundreds of uh, 
uh, texts about this controversy, at least in, in German-speaking world. But it was also an intellectual scandal in Enlightenment Europe. And the controversy was essentially, even if not exhaustively, about false account of free will uh, in relation to the doctrine of pre-established harmony. I will come back to this in, in, in a minute. And indeed, when Voltaire and, uh, and uh, Frederick, at that point still the crown prince of Prussia, uh, began uh, corresponding on August 8th, 1936, uh, 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 Voltaire was very interested in the pietist controversy uh, from the first letter onwards, while Frederick, of course, wanted to talk about uh, Wolf's metaphysics because he was a great uh, admirer of, of Wolf and Wolf's metaphysics at that point still. Okay, uh, but let's take a look at the timeline here, skipping some slides. So the correspondence between uh, Voltaire and Frederick started on August 8, uh, 36, and, uh, and then this is what I said already. Uh, then uh, Frederick starts to send uh, uh, Wolf's works translated into French uh, to, to Voltaire. Voltaire receives the German logic already in September uh, 30, uh, 36. But then in the beginning of uh, December, uh, Voltaire basically flees for the Netherlands. And uh, Presumably, while being there, he receives the first half of German metaphysics. And most likely, this half uh, contained chapter three, so uh, empirical psychology, where Wolf discusses free will in a way I just said, I just uh, uh, presented. And then in, in uh, February, uh, Voltaire returns to Sire uh, or Sare, or how, how do you pronounce it? Um, pardon my French. Uh, and then Voltaire tells to Frederick in, in, in the next month, in March, that uh, Du Châtelet read this first half of German metaphysics in French translation. And it, then at some point uh, by October, Voltaire reserves the translation of the second part. So we think that this gives uh, uh, reasons to believe that it's likely that uh, Du Châtelet was acquainted with Wolf on free will at some point in 37. And indeed, uh, Ursula Winter in, in her article uh, says, for example, that in, in 37 Du Châtelet had already met Baron von Kaiserlink, Wolf's translator, on a pr private visit he paid to, to Sire, and then also saying that, okay, uh, there, there is uh, further evidence that. Uh, that Du Châtelet was uh, acquainted with, with Wolf's philosophy also in more generally. Okay, just very quickly then, a little bit uh, on the pietist uh, critique of Wolf on free will. And this, this guy here is uh, Joachim Lange, a professor of theology at, at Halle and, uh, and a fierce pietist, apparently. So, Lange published, Lange published um, many critiques of Wolf on, on these matters. And uh, one of the main criticisms is that Wolf's account doesn't satisfy a necessary condition for a free act. Namely, the will has a efficacious causal contribution to the act independent from the intellect of the senses. So Lange is, is, a, is a voluntarist, and that's why he criticizes Wolf in this respect. So Lange thinks that we will, by the mere power of the will, are independent from the, from the understanding of the intellect. But of course, uh, uh, Wolf's view doesn't satisfy this necessary condition because uh, Wolf rejects uh, physical influx uh, from the soul uh, to the body. And that's why Lange thinks that, okay, Wolf got it wrong. And what is worse, uh, Lange, Lange thinks that, uh, according to Wolf, the will is necessary by the understanding, and that makes, actually, uh, or reduces human agency to the working of a clock, having an internal principle, namely the PSR, and this is not good. 
actually Lange argues that uh, this leads to stoicism or partial spinozism uh, leading of course to atheism which is not good at all <laughs> and so Lange's conclusion is that this is determinism clearly he actually means more like a necessarianism in our terms than uh, determinism and anyway absolute uh, fatalism but really the issue uh, as you can see interest controversy the philosophical kind of core issue is is uh, compatibilism versus uh, voluntarism in relation to the pre-established harmony and Lange argues that okay well view uh, uh, leads to, to fatalism and atheism okay but now let's uh, go to Duchatelet. So Jan will continue Thank from you, this point. So, uh, basically, uh, when we read Duchatelet's on freedom, we, you, we can find that there are several key aspects on the wheel's freedom. I, if we especially uh, focus on the wheel's freedom instead of freedom of action, uh, there are several key aspects of the wheel's freedom where Duchatelet and Wolf do agree. Uh, first of all, the physical, so this meaning external determination, is incompatible with freedom. Uh, also, that the will and the power of self-motion are distinct entities. And also, that the will requires reasons or motivations to work as it should. Also, it should be noted here that, like Wolf, Duchatelet also supports the PSR. And we know that she supports it at least from 1739 and 1740 onward based on the uh, early drafts of the Institute or the foundations of physics that we have. Of course, it's, uh, and of, uh, of course, although, uh, although like Wolf, uh, Amy, uh, Duchatelet does not restrict the PSR just to contingent truths. And of course, it's uncertain uh, whether Duchatelet already supported the PSR in 1737, when she was writing that on freedom. Uh, however, as Janni just talked, the first half of the uh, German metaphysics had arrived already by 30, 1736, when Voltaire was still in the Netherlands. And the first, par the first part of the German metaphysics uh, already includes the PSR. So uh, we can at least uh, we can at least say that Duchatelet was, have, uh, was aware of PSR by this time. Whether she uh, fully supported it or not, difficult to say, but at least she was affair, aware of it. Uh, so, close to Wolf, Duchatelet likewise considers the will the last perception of approval of the understanding. Uh, this is the first. This is the uh, first way that she describes the will in the on freedom there's only a, there's the other the only other explicit characterization of the will says for one easily feels that willing judging and so on are merely different functions of our understanding and i would like to point out here that uh, unfortunately we were not able to get access to the original text in french for this for this talk so we are, so we are <laughs> relying here on julia Jorati's translation we had two other trans we had two, uh, two other translations, so we here we are relying on Julius. Uh, but so, so basically, here we can see that Duchatelet considers the wheel very close to Wolf. That it, the wo that the uh, the wheel and the and the, the wheel and the understanding are basically the same power. There is no there is not they shouldn't be considered distinct distinct powers, but the same power. And this is clearly different from, for example. Uh, Clark's account of the will as the exercise of the self power of self-motion. However, Duchatelet also considers that the reasons of the will cannot be the efficient cause of our actions, but only their occasion. And this is what she writes. The will is never the cause of our actions, even though it is their occasions. And for an abstract, I, we can get back to the rest of the quote later, but this is very interesting because, of course, like the question arises, why would she think of this way? And here we would like to, here we would like to offer some some reasoning for her why she thinks that the that there is no that the, there is no efficient cause, but it's an occasion. <coughs> so, 
Basically, Du Châtelet explicitly denies that there's a physical influx. And of course, physical influx, like Yanni just told, is favored by Lange. But, but she uh, explicitly and clearly denies that physical influx is not possible. Also, there is nothing in the own freedom to indicate that she would favor pre-established harmony, which of course Wolf favors as the most probable, op most probable option. Instead, like Yanni mentioned a bit, she seems to favor the third option, which is the occasionalism. Although, of course, one has to say that the textual evidence for this is very scarce. There's only the one, one instance where she mentions uh, that the, uh, the, the, reasons are own, the reasons of the intellect or re reasons of the intellect and will are only the occasion of our, of our physical motion. So, it, so, so this is a very scarce, uh, scarce textual evidence that we are going on, but at least she hints towards occasionalism. Now, of course, when talking about occasionalism, one has to point out that the Châtelet's occasionalism is not really Malebranchian here. Of course, there is debate what Malebranchian occasionalism as is, is. We leave this debate for the Malebranchian scholars. But whether, whatever Malebranchian occasionalism is, du Châtelet's doesn't seem to be the same. Instead, she, her occasionalism is occasional causation. Uh, which an occasional causation would be a non-efficient form of causation that follows the natural laws. So it's not against, so it's basically ju it's just uh, the natural laws work in one way and, the non and there is a kind of a non-efficient causation that it applies to them. This is the occasional, occasional causation. And uh, uh, Julia and also Aaron have very, uh, very well established that this was probably influ influenced by so, uh, by Samuel Clark's account and her and Duchatelet's reading of the Leibniz Clark correspondence, and this is basically we 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 uh, I think this is this is this is very this is very uh, probable. Yes. However, this also means that Wolf's criti criticism of Malebranchian occasionalism doesn't really apply to her because Duchatelet's occasionalism is not the same as Malebranche's occasionalism. So, whatever Malebranchian occasionalism is. Uh, Wolf's criticism of it does not apply to Du Châtelet's conception. And now, so the question, of course, rises: Why does Du Châtelet favor occasionalism instead of physical influx or the pre-established harmony? Well, physical influx is clearly against the conser conver conservation of physical motion, and this is what she says in the on freedom, an abstract notion cannot have any physical influence over the physical self-moving power. This is clearly against uh, laws of nature, against the conversation of physical motion. There cannot be any influx from uh, our, our thinking to, f uh, to our acting, or our, our physical acting. The question then why she doesn't favor pre-established harmony, it's a bit more difficult to say just based on the on freedom. However, uh, this is more speculation, but like Yanni established there in the previous parts, uh, uh, pre-established harmony according to the Pietist critique leads to fatalism. And of course, th we could speculate that this might be the reason why Du Châtelet is sort of like against the notion of uh, pre-established harmony. Of course, th uh, this depends much on how much, how deeply she knew about the uh, pietist, con pietist critique and the, and the controversy. Difficult to say, but this could be one option why she does not favor pre-established, I think she doesn't clearly favor pre-established harmony. Uh, so, by if we go by this occasional causation notion, uh, w the will has then the we can say that the will has a true yet non-efficient causal contribution to the act, w without of course the will being independent of the w without being independent of the intellect, of course, while it's also being inter internally determined. And there are a couple of quotes here where Du Châtelet clearly seems to be talking for the internal de determination of the will. Uh, the first one is, if it were to follow that man is not free because his will is always determined by things that his understanding judges to be best, 
it would follow that God is not free and that everything in the universe would be effect without cause, which is absurd. Now, uh, one could see a bit of a hint of VSR here. It's not really clear whether it's the, uh, like the actual VSR or something similar to it. But if, if one reads it, one could see a bit of a VSR here. The other quote which, I'm, uh, which I have no, uh, noted here is, man is under the, necessity, under the necessity of willing that which his judgment presents to him as best. So it's pretty clear that, uh, that here du Châtelet seems to be like Wolf favoring intellectualist, co intellectualist compatibilism at least w according to the freedom of the will. Uh, however, by, by talking about freedom of the will, uh, it not, might not be sufficient because Du Châtelet's character, uh, char characterizations of freedom do not always seem to be in line. Sometimes she characterizes freedom very similar to Wolf as the freedom of will that is determined by what judge understanding judges to be best. A couple of quotes, for example, I call freedom the power of thinking of one thing or of not thinking of it, of moving or not moving in accordance with the choice of one's own mind. Another one is, is doing what we want and what we judge to be the most advantageous, not exactly the same as being free. Uh, the third one, to will that which does not please is a genuine contradiction. And being free means doing what one judges to be best. And we, we could contrast this with Wolf, who writes, freedom is nothing other than the power of the soul through its own spontaneity for choosing that one among two equally possible things that pleases it most. So here, well, uh, Du Châtelet seems to be very much in line with Wolf. But of course, like established, there are other places where Du Châtelet seems to emphasize the freedom of acts instead of the freedom of the will. And this is very much unlike Wolf, because for Wolf, uh, freedom of uh, will is freedom of the will is the basically the same thing as freedom. So there is no difference. With, so she, at least Wolf does not, uh, does not emphasize the freedom of action. But Du Châtelet clearly does. For example, uh, in 494, the physical power of acting is thus what makes man a free being. Another quote, and this is very interesting. This is especially very interesting. The self-moving power, the sole and true source of freedom, cannot be destroyed by the indiscernibility of two objects. Now this seems to be, if one reads this in a certain way, that she, was, she, she would actually be hinting here that I, when like, we have two equally deter motivating uh, reasons we could still act. If one reads this like this, this is obviously against Wolf, because Wolf says, since without motives one can neither will nor not will. It is impossible that someone wills something or not when motives of equal weight are present on each, eye, each side. So this, is, this part is a bit interesting. However, I do not think it's completely against the compatibilist reading, because even a compatibilist could say that the uh, that the power that this freedom uh, that the physical physical power of acting is not destroyed by the indiscernibility of two objects. It's just that we cannot actualize this power, but it's not really ag against the compatibilistic reading. Uh, of course, people in the audience might disagree, but <laughs> at least we say that it's not against the reading. We, 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 we don't have to read this li in, a libertarian, uh, in a libertarian way, necessarily. Okay, so wrapping up. I could say something. Do you want to still say something in the wrapping up section? Or? No, no, you can go. Okay, I can go. Okay. So basically wha what we have tried to establish here is that Du Châtelet's conception of the will in on freedom is very close to that of Wolf. The, uh, and of course, this, this, this applies mostly to the conception of the will. So they are not numerically distinct entities in the soul, but they are basically the same thing. Both Wolf and Du Châtelet think that the understanding morally necessitates the will, which is intellectualist compatibilism. 
we, the, uh, we must will what we judge to be the best. Therefore, the, it is not really possible that, plausible that Emily considers Wolf one of the targets, these illustrious opponents of freedom, of her criticism in on freedom. Uh, now, uh, so we could say something about what Aaron has, uh, what has Aaron has been uh, arguing for the libertarianism of Duchatelet. Uh, of course, libertarianism would be the power to do otherwise. Like Janid established previously, Wolf also thinks that it's absolutely possible to do otherwise. It's just only not morally possible. And of course, Duchatelet does the same uh, distinction here. Where in 949, one must carefully distinguish between physical necessity and moral necessity. The former is always absolute, but the latter is always contingent. And this moral necessity is entirely compatible with the most perfect and physical freedom. So if we go back to this part here, uh, cannot, yeah, the self-moving power cannot be destroyed by the interaction of two objects. May, what, she, uh, what she might be saying here could be just that it's in the in this like absolute sense it is possible to move. We just cannot actualize it. it, it, it like the ju just that we are in a in this sort of like a buried and ass situation does not tr destroy our freedom. We just cannot actualize our freedom of uh, freedom of acting. So, and this is what we think that uh, Aaron does not really discuss this option for a compatibilist. That this is all still this is still open for a uh, for a compatibilist to say this. And then finally, uh, basically uh, their, uh, their accounts. So when we are talking about there, we of course mean Duchatel and Wolf. So Duchatel and Wolf's accounts of the relation between the will and act will and physical action are different. Wolf considers pre-established harmony to be the most likely hypothesis, whereas Duchatelet might favor occasional causation. And by this, she could then consider the will having a non-efficient causal contribution to the act, which of course was the pietist critique of Wolf, without giving up on the intellectual's compatibilism. Now, of course, still we have to say that Duchatelet clearly emphasized the relevance of the power of self-motion for freedom much more than Wolf does. So, here it seems that Duchatelet locates freedom more in action than Wolf. So, of course, uh, this kind of a libertarian reading is possible, but we at le we don't consider it like we, we don't we don't consider the clearly uh, the, the text uh, we don't consider the text to be clearly in favor of the libertarian reading. It is possible, but the reading also clearly we we can also read it as a compatibilist. And so, thank you. <laughs>